Aaron Copeland was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1900. His father was a Russian Jewish immigrant and his older sister taught him to play piano. At the age of 15, he decides he wants to be a composer. So he does what any other 15-year-old kid who wants to be a composer would do. He sends away for a correspondence course and starts learning to be a composer by mail. Not surprisingly, he's not very satisfied with the quality of instruction he's getting through the mail. So he hooks up with a real teacher near him. And one thing that this real music teacher tells him is, whatever you do, stay away from the modern composers. And as most of us know, if you really want to get teenagers interested in something, you tell them, stay away from it. By age 18, he's considered a musical rebel. And at age 21, he gets to study under a very famous music teacher named Nadia Boulanger in Paris as her first full-time American student. She's really well known. She teaches people like Stravinsky and Pierre Henri. Copeland spends three years in Paris doing some very experimental pieces. He returns to New York with a commission from his teacher to write a concerto for organ. But this commission isn't a whole lot to live on, so while he's doing this, he's got to come up with some other way to make a living. So he becomes the hotel piano player for a hotel in Pennsylvania. His symphony for organ and orchestra was played in 1924 by the New York Symphony. The piece's quality and reception led the conductor to say, if a young man at the age of 23 can write a symphony like that, in five years, he'll be ready to commit murder. Copeland was one of these rare composers who happened to be in the right place at the right time. Fellowships, private patronage, commissions, and all sorts of prizes came his way. He never had a problem making money from his music. He used this good fortune to help promote the works of other composers. He wrote many articles advocating modern music and wrote books with titles such as What to Listen for in Music and Our New Music, which were quite successful. This is one of the best things about Copeland. Not only is he writing new music, he's trying to educate people about it, to make people understand how wonderful this new music is. He even teaches at Harvard for a few years. After his first symphony, he decides he wants to write music that is essentially American. And he feels at the time that the best way to do this is through using jazz. So he wants to write a symphonic piece that takes all the ideas and feelings and essence of jazz and turns it into something that's important. And he does this through a piece called Music for the Theater. Using jazz was an easy way to be American, but he felt ultimately it was too limiting. See, at the time, there were really only two approaches to jazz. There was the blues, which is sort of slow and swingy and emotional, and the snappy number. And that's just not enough space for a composer to work in on serious pieces. He starts working on some really weird stuff that's kind of influenced by Stravinsky, but he doesn't like the way that's going. He found himself writing for orchestra, which is by its nature designed to reach the public, but he was making stuff that would never reach the average listener. See, part of the problem with orchestras is they only have so many pieces they can learn in any given year, and they gotta sell tickets, right? They gotta eat. So what that means is they try to please the audience. They want to not challenge the audience's expectations too much. And what they find out is that if they have two programs, one of which is going to play the old favorites like Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner, people are going to go to that rather than anything that's going to perform new music. Especially if that new music is hard to listen to, the way Stravinsky was or the way the 12-tone guys were. Copeland asks himself, for whom am I writing? In his words, during these years, I began to feel an increasing dissatisfaction with the relations of the music-loving public and the living composer. The old, special public of modern music concerts had fallen away, and the conventional concert public continued apathetic or indifferent to anything but the established classics. It seemed to me that we composers were in danger of working in a vacuum. Moreover, an entirely new public for music had grown up around the radio and the phonograph. It made no sense to ignore them and to continue writing as if they did not exist. I felt that it was worth the effort to see if I couldn't say what I had to say in the simplest possible terms. Not only does he want to be simple, but he wants to express himself in a very American way. And what's more simple or more inherently American and more popular than the cowboy? So this 
son of Russian Jewish parents who's from Brooklyn starts writing cowboy music. Or rather, music influenced by cowboys. His first of three ballets is completed in 1939, and it's called Billy the Kid. And it's about Billy the Kid. In Billy the Kid, he was creating life not from what he knew, but from his imagination. He was using cowboy songs as a jumping off point. This using existing elements as a jumping off point for something new is one of the hallmarks of some great art. But before we criticize him too much for being from New York, from Brooklyn, and writing about cowboys, we should probably also note that Billy the Kid was from Brooklyn. Copeland's ballet masterpiece, though, is Rodeo. Completed in 1942, the melodic material is largely derived from Western American folk songs, from cowboy songs. Copeland does another piece called Appalachian Spring in 1944, and Appalachian Spring uses the Shaker hymn Simple Gifts as some of its source material. You've heard Copeland's music countless times. He wrote another piece called Fanfare for the Common Man, which is used in all sorts of commercials. Almost any time somebody wants to make music that, or use music that sounds American, they use Copeland. One of the reasons for this is that Copeland's music sounds very simple and very plain. It's not hard to listen to at all. But when you start digging deeper, you start seeing the real genius of Copeland. His music is frequently polytonal. Even though it's usually grounded in a single key, he always tends to layer another key right on top of it. He uses simple, direct melodies, nice little fragments that are easy to latch onto. His music is also very rhythmic. It's accessible. But the nice thing about Copeland's music is that, aside from being easy to listen to, if you listen to it carefully, if you dig a little bit, you start listening to what he's really doing, it's fantastic. His stuff is much more complicated than it appears at first listen. And this is one of the reasons why he's one of the greatest composers of the 20th century. <laughs>